Hi, my name is Lisa Lindahl, and I have beaten the often path by busting a lot of myths about what it means to be a woman, a woman with a disability, and written about it. (laughs) Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast, the show where we take a step back and look at the story of our lives and careers with a wide angle lens. On this show, we highlight unusual success stories to remind us that there are an infinite number of paths to happiness and success in this world. And we're careful here not to define success in only monetary terms. I think you will agree with me that my guest today is really an incredible individual. Lisa Lindahl is the inventor of the sports bra, or as it was known back in 1977, the jog bra. Her invention has changed the world of women's sports forever earning her a place in the Smithsonian and in the National Inventors Hall of Fame in Washington alongside legendary inventors like Thomas Edison. She's an American treasure. She's also an author, a champion of epilepsy education and empowerment, and the inventor of a device for people recovering from breast cancer. Quite simply, I just can't tell you how thrilled I am to have her on today's show. So here is Lisa Lindahl. Well, we're off to a great start. So I'm very thrilled, humbled, and deeply honored that you have joined me here on this podcast. I really can't wait to get to know your story. So first of all, thank you for being here. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited. This is fun. Yes, well, it's certainly going to be fun for me. Um, You have a truly remarkable story. Your, Your career arc is incredible. As soon as I found you online, I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is exactly... The kind of story that I'm looking for, Um, I'm obviously looking for unusual stories, uh, especially empowering stories or entrepreneurial stories, creative stories. Yours is all of the above and then some. So if you could, could you give uh, our listeners a little bit of an idea about what generally your career has been? Well, I can start by saying what I'm most known for is inventing the sports bra back in 1977, a long time ago. Um, I run into a lot of young women who go, what? And you're still alive? Because they can't (laughs) imagine a time when there wasn't a sports bra. Um, But besides that, I've also um, done a lot of volunteer work with the Epilepsy Foundation. I also have another, um, well, I have a company at the moment called Belize, which um, manufactures compression devices for women with breast cancer. Um, and I've written two books. Okay. Oh, and I suppose, did I say anything about, um, I have epilepsy. So, so a lot of people growing up didn't have much um, hope for me, much didn't think there's be big, a big life for me. They didn't sure. have big expectations. Right. And somehow I had the wisdom to choose to ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> Always sage advice. <laughs> I think that's something that a lot of our listeners need to hear for sure. Right. So the first book I wrote is called Beauty as Action, The Way of True Beauty and How Its Practice Can Change Our World. Oh, here I am. Shameless plug. That's what we're here um, for. Exactly. It's all a shameless plug yeah. at the end of the day. And um, I'd love to talk about that a bit in a bit. Um, And then the next book I wrote was uh, called Unleash the Girls, the untold story of the invention of the sports bra and how it changed the world and me, because it really did. Yeah. (laughs) Which surprised the heck out of me because I was just solving my own problem. I was a runner and I needed um, support. I needed a garment that would do something that nothing else was. And so I, created it. But it turned out to become a fi- feminist icon and to change um, a lot that were going on in young women's lives, in women's lives. That is so cool. I mean, there are a few stories or inventions that are as profound. It's almost so simple and so taken for granted that it's hard to believe that it was invented in a certain sense, I'm sure, for many people. It's hard to imagine, mm-hmm. like you said, that there was a time or that there was a specific person that created this thing. There are certain things that are just so woven into the fabric of our lives, this obviously being one of them. So 
it's deeply uh, fascinating to me. Uh, first of all, I'm definitely excited to uh, to buy your book after this. I can't wait to read your business Thank memoir. You. I know it's going to be incredible. It's exactly the kind of book that I love. Um, but yeah, the invention of the sports bra, which at the time you called a jog bra, right? Was that the original name? The very first name was Jock Bra because Jock Bra. A jock Bra because it's my sister and I were on the phone talking about adequate support when we were running, and she said, "Why isn't there a jock strap for women?" And <laughs> we both laughed. We thought that was uproarious. But then I sat down after we hung up and went, "Yeah, why isn't there why isn't a different there? Part of anatomy?" And so it's in the beginning we called it the Jock Bra, okay. but. Then we found out that maybe that wasn't the best marketing choice and called it jog bra. Right. And uh, when did it end up being called the sports bra? When did that change? Well, we, um, it's, it's like, you know, Kleenex is facial tissue. So for a long time, um, jog bras meant, and, and sports bra was just synonymous. And because other people couldn't use the term jog bra, ah. we owned it. They started calling it sports bra. Okay. So that's fine with me. <laughs> sure. And, um, you know, as with all the case, I think there are so many people out there who encounter a problem. Many of the guests on this show have encountered a personal problem. And the story is often similar, something that affects you personally. And you say, I'm going to solve this. I'm very fascinated. What was the first step to thinking that you had a product? How did you go about solving this problem? Well, that's an excellent question because I don't sew. Okay. <laughs> so here I had this idea and I was very clear about what it needed to do. I had listed all the problems and issues that needed, you know, like minimize breast movement and straps that don't fall off and um, that something that deals with the sweat. And um, luckily my best friend from eighth, since eighth grade, was renting a room from me that summer because she's a costume designer and she was doing the costumes for a local theater. And so I went up to her room and said, knocked on the door and said, Holly, I need your help. And so she actually was the one that translated my vision into fabric and elastic. She shopped the fabric. She did the pattern. Wow. Yeah. So all help. done. It's always good to in-house. ask for help. With a friend. So you and one friend brought this thing to life. We did. And then a third woman entered, um, Hinda, because she was very enthusiastic about all this. And um, her family gave us our initial money to get uh, to do our first run of, <laughs> to manufacture our first run of bras, to buy the fabric. and. So what, what did that look like? That. How much uh, money was the first run? Uh, five grand, I think. Five grand. In 1978. Okay. So I had the idea in 1977. We made the prototype. I incorporated, you know, and then um, I sent the prototype to Hinda, who was in South Carolina. And she actually found a mom and pop uh, fa- manufacturing firm that were, was willing to take on just one, a single product in three sizes. <laughs> You know, any established factory would never do such a thing. Mm. So we, so it was entrepreneurs supporting each other, really. And I thought, oh, Ross, I thought that this would be a nice little mail order business on the side sure. for other women. And it would allow me to get through graduate school. Well, I had to quit school. <laughs> had to quit. Because it took off right away. It took off right away. Okay. Right away. So how, right how away. many units were the first run? Oh, gosh. Oh, I don't actually remember. Sorry. That's I don't fine. remember that. Um, like a car JD, full, a trunk full, <laughs> the Nike story? Or? Well, no, boxes and boxes, boxes because and boxes. my apartment in Burlington, Vermont became our offices. So my living room turned into the warehouse. My dining room turned into the office. And the orders just came pouring in. And then re- let us remember that this is before computers, before the internet, everything was, you know, we placed an ad in a running magazine and um, the orders came in the mail. And we used to, when we first started out, we didn't know what we were going to ship them in because if a store ordered some, they were ordering six or 12 or something. 
And so we would go around and scrounge behind grocery stores to find cardboard boxes to, <laughs> to <laughs> ship our <laughs> bras in. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. But that did not last long. I'm sure. um, our first full year in business, uh, we did like over half a million at, in revenue and um, were profitable. And in 1970, was 79 our first year or 78? I don't remember. I'd have to look at my book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, we didn't know that was unusual. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're like, oh, this just you just start a business and the money just comes pouring in. Has anybody the orders, done any the other? Order. The other, okay. Yeah. And all uh, from a single ad and a single running magazine? Well, in the fir at first, yes. Um, and then... Incredible. Because my background is education and, and marketing. I mean, I was in grad school for um, educational administration. And all marketing, good marketing is really, is education. Mm -hmm. And so I was clear at the get-go that this was not lingerie. Mm -hmm. This was athletic equipment. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to sell um, into sporting goods stores. Yeah. And I, I also knew that the department, up then, you wouldn't necessarily know this, but up until then, bras were only sold in department stores or lingerie specialty stores. Mm. And I knew that that was not who we were. And we couldn't play the department store game. We were too, too small. But yeah. we could walk into a sporting goods store and they would, they'd get it. The part they're often back then participant owners, guys who are runners and guys, notice guys. Well, we've reached that point, that super interesting point in the episode where we like to switch gears, do a little promotion here, but it's not for anything crazy. It's not for a supplement or something weird like that. Instead, it's just for me to remind you that if you enjoy the show, if you like this episode, if you like these guests, know that it is very hard work to put this together, to find it, to coordinate it, to do all of the things related to bringing this to you. So what you can do for me if you want to keep this going is to rate the show five stars on Apple Podcasts, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, subscribe on Spotify, subscribe on YouTube, share, like, comment, do all of the things that help something like this grow. If you know somebody who needs to hear this, send them this story, send them the link. Do anything to help other people learn about this show, and I would be forever grateful. I don't ask much. Most of what I do, I just give, give, give for free, free, free the entire time. But you could really, really contribute to the growth of this podcast by doing just a couple simple things that take you less than a minute to do. So, again, if you would do that, I would greatly appreciate it. Please pause, take the time to do all of that. And then, when you're done, let's come back right now to the show. Immediately, they all understood there was no pushback. It was just, oh, that makes sense. Okay. No, of course we got pushback mm -hmm. and a lot of comments. And mm -hmm. of course we did. But I remember 10 years later um, at the National Sporting Goods Association trade show where dealers came from all over. And um, it was our 10th anniversary. And we gave uh, awards out to what we called pioneer dealers for those dealers who back way back when, had taken a chance and stocked the product and were still customers in 1988. Mm -hmm. so. so, okay, immediate success. Obviously, you know, like you said, you had no idea that it was going to become what it eventually became or representative of what it eventually did. And just for a little background for our listeners, it's either it or you were inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. I guess you in Washington, D.C., the National Inventors Hall of Fame, which is insane with Thomas Edison and many of the other great American inventors of all time, uh, featured in the Smithsonian with this caption that I think is worth repeating. Quote, the introduction of the sports bra did more than improve athletes' performances. It represented a revolution in ready-to-wear clothing, and for many women athletes, past, present, and future, it actually made sports possible. Unquote. True. That, Which is insane to consider, especially with the Olympics just having passed. So, when did you start to realize that you had something more than just a product success on your hands? Well, uh, there are so many layers of answers to that question. Um, and it happened in different degrees. When we were running the company, I found that. 
you know, most of our employees were women and it, the, that whole experience was empowering for them. Um, so part of what our product was, was also the, the culture that we had there. And, and it wasn't all pretty. I mean, part of why I wrote the book was it, it's not just a Unleash the Girls is not just a business memoir. It's really a story of women becoming, getting over their insecurities, gaining confidence, dealing with conflict, learning the difference between being assertive and aggressive. Mm -hmm. You know, we were really what is now referred to as second wave feminism. Mm -hmm. And in the um, late 70s, and all during the 80s, that's what was going on. And so my first realization that there was something more here had to do with that, that we were employing people that, um, and, and learning you know, how to manage people. And then I, um, we sold the company after running it for 12 years okay. uh, to Playtex Apparel. And I left. I did my employment contract, but then I left because I felt like there was something more. And that's when I started... Um, when I went on the board of the Epilepsy Foundation of America and I started teaching and, um, and I've always written. I have always written. I, I started out as an artist. Mm -hmm. So going into business was kind of weird. Right. Like all my artist friends said, what are you doing? I get that completely. <laughs> but um, so after I sold the company, it was really, I tried to distance myself from, I, I didn't want to be uh, capsulized into the, you're the jog bra lady, which I got a lot. Oh, oh you're course. the jog bra lady. And, um, you know, I, I, I did a lot at the Epilepsy Foundation and um, started another business, went back to painting, went back into the studio. But the point is, it was maybe 30 years later when the interviewing didn't stop. People didn't stop asking for information about the sports bra. And the Smithsonian took all of our records and photos and all this other stuff into their archives of the National uh, Museum of, of American History. And I'm, I was like, what? Really? <laughs> <laughs> and um, that really... The combination of people coming to me for advice and to hear the story and to find out how I did it and also what happened for young women. I mean, I started running because I was trying to change my relationship with my body and really I found it so empowering on so many different levels. And when I realized that that was happening for millions of girls and women out that they had the same experience, then I realized that the jog bra had really changed the flow of the river for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And then I could say, okay, I'll own this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll own this and um, respect it. And I am proud, but really very humble about what happened has occurred as a result of this. I've since learned, I should say, sure. I've since learned that, you know, the history of underwear has, says a lot about what's going on in politics and, and, the, and cultures. And, you know, that wasn't anything I was aware of when I started, but since then I've went, oh, okay. Yeah. You, you know, I, I don't know if you, do you know, masterclass.com? You're familiar with mm -hmm. this, obviously. Mm -hmm. Very similar in many ways to the Sarah Blakely story, the inventor of Spanx, uh, how she was saying that undergarments were almost exclusively designed by men who had never worn these things. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. she couldn't even convince them why her product might be necessary. They said, oh, but we've got these things covered. We've got small, medium, and large. What else <laughs> could we possibly need? Right? <laughs> Here's a mannequin. It's done. Right. And she's thinking like, no, maybe there's something more to it than that. Exactly, ex exactly. And w because when we started, when we started and we'd go to these trade shows and call on these customers, we were the only woman owned business in the industry. Unbelievable. Shortly thereafter, a, a woman's clothing company, uh, Moving Comfort, started up. But really, that was it. 
every other woman on the floor of the trade show was someone's secretary, wife, a model, maybe, maybe once in a while a buyer. Right. So you're creating a woman-owned business. I mean, again, this is the kind of story that I'm so after. I'm, I don't know if you picked up on this, but I have a, a young daughter, my first daughter. She's three years old. And this is exactly <laughs> the kind of stuff that I want her to hear as she grows up. I want her to know that this is possible. Right. That you right. can yes. do it yourself, that you don't need permission from somebody else, that you can create something, you can build your team. It's exactly the kind of values that I want her to to grow up with. So... I know well, when that. she's a little when she's a little older in her teens, give her unleash the girls because it talks a lot about again overcoming insecurities or expectations or uh, it, and it's always it's a struggle it's always a struggle and it is for everyone but it's so worthwhile. So in your personal life, obviously everything changed for you. <laughs> So you have this enormous success, millions of people buying this product. Um, wh what happened in your personal journey during all of this? You transitioned to epilepsy, which I'd like to hear how that happened. Um, how did your personal life change as this was happening? Well, Ross, when I started the company, I was married. And because of the epilepsy, I couldn't drive a car. I couldn't even drive a car. And I was in the process of ending that marriage when I started Jog Bra. Okay. And that was traumatic because how was I going to get to the grocery store? How was I going to do laundry? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was walking to school and walking to my job. And um, so I had, a, I had some hurdles that are particular to me, but everybody has their hurdles. And um, I, I tell a story. So my personal life changed dramatically. I went from being a married part-time worker, part-time student, part-time artist to being uh, having to put this business together and uh, writing a business plan. <laughs> that was an education. And thank God for the Small Business Administration. They are an excellent resource. They taught me how to write this business plan. But, but cool. my um, personal life changed dramatically. And I had been, I've had epilepsy since I was, I was diagnosed at age four. Okay. And so I've been taking medicine and dealing with it all my life. And, but I was always told, you don't want to live alone because that's dangerous. What mm -hmm. if you had a seizure while you were alone? And, mm -hmm. and so that was this shadow hanging over me. And all of a sudden I was living alone and I had to get a driver's license. And <laughs> it was, um, uh, I had to step up. And it was the fact that I'd been running that empowered me, gave me the courage and the creative juices and the desire to do that, to say, okay. So my personal life changed. All of a sudden I was traveling because I was the sales and marketing end of the business. Right. Into doing the production. And Polly had said, look, here's, here's what I've done. I'm going back to costume design. And I should, which she did do. She was, um, and I have to say that she's gone on to earn eight Emmys for her costume what? design. Oh my God, what kind of magic did you guys tap into? <laughs> so really, I mean, exactly, exactly. <laughs> what kind of magic did we tap into? I mean, I have no doubt that a sports bra would have been developed at some point in mm. the, during that era because that's when physical fitness was all, you know, it was happening. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that it was done by three women in Vermont in 1977, it, it really, really was magic continues to be magic because the three of us also were very different, very different. Um, and that was both a strength and a struggle. I can imagine. And Did I, I also, answer your question? It does, yeah. And I also read that you have, at the moment, I think 10 U.S. patents, right? Is that correct? That is correct. Did you patent the original idea? How did that yes. happen? Okay. <laughs> well, um... I don't know. I just knew that that was something that we should look into. And mm -hmm. um, I was standing in line in the post office <laughs> back in year one. And 
uh, being upset because I couldn't find a patent attorney in this area. And this guy in line, we started chatting and he directed me to a, an excellent patent um, lawyer firm mm -hmm. uh, in Washington, D.C. So the first patent was for the jog bra. Wow. And uh, did, did you do that? Or how much did it cost you? Was it something that was donated to the cause? or I, I have... I don't remember okay. what it cost. It cost. It cost, okay. Um, it definitely cost. But also, you know, uh, applying for a patent, waiting for it to be granted, gained, no one could copy us right away. They had to wait until the patent came out. Mm. So that gave us a, about a six to nine month leap ahead in the marketplace. And then once they could... I mean, a garment patent is very easy to break. You just change a seam or use different thread or... Um, so that gave us a real head start mm -hmm. while it was pending, patent pending. It was a very powerful thing to be able to say. And after it was out, then, and, and the, let me just say, and that it, it, it sh all the sales started happening. The, the big players, the regular bra companies came out with their versions. But something I say often when, um, I'm teaching or talking about starting something, you really can't listen to the naysayers. Because if I had done any market research, I would have discovered, I, I maybe wouldn't have ever done the business because I would have discovered that bra sales had been flat, pun intended, <laughs> for the past decade. Uh, and it's because... You know, I was that generation, the 60s and the 70s, and we were burning our right, bras, burning if, them, not, yeah. if not actually, certainly metaphorically. And so all the big um, bra manufacturers, they had only been fighting for market share for years. And when the sports bra came along, all of a sudden, it, it increased. The actual market increased. Every woman had two, probably three sports bras, jog bras in mm -hmm. her drawer. And so everybody jumped in. Unbelievable. <laughs> so, all right. So while this is happening, this business is running, you eventually sell it. Your life has changed. And how did you get involved with epilepsy as a cause? Um, I was approached by their, um, the Epilepsy Foundation is set up with chapters in different states. And um, the woman that ran the Vermont chapter uh, approached me and asked if I would be on the local board. And I, I said, yes, yes. And that was the beginning of a real journey for me of, of discovery, because up until that point, I had been very private. Uh, nobody really talks about epilepsy. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear about diabetes, you hear about cancer, but very, especially then no one was talking about epilepsy and there's a stigma attached. Um, so I kept pretty quiet about it. And I would always, I've always been, I've never been uh, secretive or I've never covered it up, but I also didn't talk. About it. And all of a sudden, I found myself in a group of people who all talked about it, who knew about it, who, when you talked about a certain medication, said, oh, yeah, you know. And that, through that board, the local board, I was, tapped by the national board in D.C. because I was a woman, because I was a businesswoman. And at the time, when I went on that board, I was the first person with epilepsy to actually be on the foundation's board of directors. Interesting. So you had inside information that wasn't there. Well, and, and this is indicative of attitudes at the time. I mean, you would think, right. I mean, the, the foundation had been operating for many decades in different permutations. And to be the first person with a seizure disorder, to be setting policy and talking about programs. And I mean, that's kind of, anyway, those were those times. <laughs> yeah, which it's funny. I mean, obviously we're, we're all aware of that, but it's just hard to believe how much that permeated everything back then, right? It's always the same story, like, you know, elderly white men determining everything. <laughs> they're setting policy for women. Right. They're setting garments for women. They're dressing women. They're creating the policy for black people. It's just this one group of people 
hey, we know what's best for people with epilepsy. Really, do any of you have it? Have you ever dealt with it? No, but... <laughs> well, <laughs> however, I do... We've got a full liquor have... cabinet right over here, so <laughs> we're clearly very wise. I have to wise. jump in here. So, Ross, I have to jump in here and yeah. say one of the things I talk about both in Unleash the Girls mm-hmm. and in Beauty and Action is the fact that... Um, we 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 can't focus on the the on the dominator culture and and the patriarchy mm-hmm. because men are just as affected by it as women mm-hmm. it's we we need to move from the sisterhood and the brotherhood into humanhood absolutely and and release men and boys from those repressive and oppressive expectations about how they should be or shouldn't be just as was with the case with women. I mean, so that's my shtick. I really, and I do write about that quite a bit. I like it. I agree. That's that's wonderful to hear. So w- when you did join the board of ep- epilepsy, what, what did you try to change or what were you trying to accomplish? Oh, attitudes, understanding. It was all about education. In fact, one of the things I'm quite proud of that I did while there was create the Women in Epilepsy Initiative, because up until that point, so little research had been done on whether or not there were, in fact, any gender differences in how epilepsy occurred in the patient. And women have very different hormones from men, and so the medications act differently, but there's no research. No one was acknowledging that. And through the Women in Epilepsy Initiative, we were able to do a white paper that that gained enough attention to garner money. And now it's a given. <laughs> now, now everyone talks. I mean, do you know that it wasn't until, well, that for years and years and years that um, the pharmaceutical companies would not test any new drugs on women of childbearing age. Hmm. Mm, I didn't but know that. Then, but then once the drugs were tested and they go out to market and women of childbearing age were taking them. And it's mm. because they were worried about any defective pregnancies that might happen while, they're, while they're, the, the tr- clinical trials were going on. Okay. And yet, so, so the real testing happened out in the marketplace. And right. that law did not change. That was a law. Uh, that was, a law. That was uh, the FDA's. Uh, thing, and that didn't change until the early 1990s. So you were just helping with all kinds of policy changes and awareness at that time? Yes, I was on the the development committee, on the programs and promotions. I don't remember the names of all the committees, but it was three successive terms, so nine years, so a lot. Wow, very interesting. And for me, I, I want to say that for me, it was it was eye opening. It was um, uh, I, again, I was in this large community of people who understood, who knew more so much about epilepsy. I learned so much about it. Um, it was it was really very powerful and encouraging. That's wonderful and inspiring. Yeah. Do, do you consider yourself an inventor first and foremost? Do you hear, read about these career inventors? Were you always coming up with other ideas or was it just lightning struck this one time? Um, I'm what I, I would call myself a visionary cosmologist. Okay. Because I see how things might could, will come together and affect, affect each other. And, and I always have, and I didn't have a name for it until recently. <laughs> and when I came to understood, understand what cosmology was about and, um, and just always being an idea person. It's one of the things that drove my partner in business nuts because she just she wanted to get things done, move it on, move it on. And I'd say, yeah, but you know, well, there's this, and then maybe we could do this, and maybe we should do this. And so I would always have three plans instead of just one. And I came to realize later in life that, that was probably an asset I gained by having a seizure disorder. 
by having epilepsy because um, the, the thing about epilepsy that makes it, I think, very mysterious to other people and difficult to handle is that it's so unpredictable. Mm. You're sitting here talking to me. I'm fine. You know, I look, I look fine. I can pass. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my day can be, I can wake up in my day. I have to cancel my day mm-hmm. because I know that I'm having seizure activity. So mm-hmm. I always have contingency plans. Mm. I, that's just how I think. I, I credit having this particular disability with making me a really creative problem solver. And it's really uh, uh, suited me. And I've, and as an artist, I've always been an artist. I've, I, I think I tried to write my first short story when I was in third grade, sitting on the floor with the typewriter in front of me going. <laughs> so. Well, there's nothing more inspiring than anybody turning a weakness into a strength, I think. It's probably the greatest thing that a human can do. Very philosophical. So I get why you would call yourself that um that makes perfect sense i i also read now was this an extension of what had happened previously um that you created a a chest compression for breast cancer patients correct how did that come about um in in breast cancer there's something called lymphedema often will happen which is swelling of the tissues and that's treated by um the Many patients are treated by physical therapists who will teach them how to do lymphatic massage to move that away. A physical therapist here in Vermont discovered that the woman that invented the sports bra lived in the town next to her, and she had been jerry-rigging old sports bras for her patients who had swollen breasts and backs and chests. And she said... We need to make something for this specifically. And it was, I mean, life is so wonderful. I mean, it was so ironic because just as I had gone to Polly way back when and said, I have this idea, we need to make this thing, help me. Leslie Bell, Dr. Leslie Bell came to me and said, Lisa, you have to help me make this thing. I don't know about manufacturing or bras or anything, but you have to help me. And she showed me pictures of women with, breast cancer, that they were in such pain. It was, their lymphedema was so bad that I couldn't say no. I could not say no. And so I sat down and I, she told me all the things it had to do, like I had told Polly all the things the sports bar had to do. She told me all the places it had to be tight, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I drew all these different scenarios. I introduced her to the, I, I got back in touch with some of my, um, some of the people at Jogbra, because that was still going on at the time. Um, even though I'd sold it, it was because this happened. The Belize Compressor Comfort Bra was born in 1999 or 2000. Mm-hmm. That's when Leslie came to me. And I had just ended my tenure at, at um, the Epilepsy Foundation. And, you know, I didn't really want to start another small business, but I really, I couldn't say no. Mm. I could not. So, um, we went and found the right fabric and found a manufac- another small entrepreneurial manufacturer here yep. in the U.S. and started making them. And did it change the game for, I'm assuming it had a profound impact? It has. It, it has. Um, we ran the comp- Leslie and I ran the comp- that little company for about five years before I said I need I can't be doing this anymore for a variety of reasons. And she was really torn between her practice um, and how she was traveling all over the country talking about lymphedema, talking about the term truncal lymphedema did not even really exist until we started. We coined it to try and express that up until then, the medical community sort of acted as if the swelling automatically stopped at the end of the arm. And so there were compression sleeves and compression, compression gloves called gauntlets, um, but nothing for the chest, breast, back. And whether you've had a mastectomy or not, it doesn't matter. You can still have that tissue swell up because the lymph glands, I mean, do we really want to, I could, 
<laughs> Call interview Leslie next. Leslie is really, she is really something. Um, I'm always looking for new ideas. So I would love well, that. She, she owns her, she owns her own um, physical therapy practice and, and Belize. She's my partner in Belize. And um, she now travels the world talking about lymphedema and compression garments. And we licensed this garment, the manufacture and sale of this garment, um, to Jobst in, in, when was it? Like quite a few years ago now. Um, so I'm not having to run the company anymore, nor is Leslie. But she, as I said, she goes to conferences and um, literally all over the world. And, and truncal lymphedema is now accepted, known to exist, and here's how you treat it. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, it is. I think we've, I mean, we've covered an insane amount of ground so far, but there's one piece that's definitely missing so far from this interview, and that is your other book, Beauty as Action, The Way of True Beauty and How Its Practice Can Change the World. What is that book about? This is truly what I think is the most important subject matter. What that, um, I finally went back to graduate school and um, got my master's in culture and spirituality. And part of that was understanding how, well, well what really matters? What's, it's looking at all those existential questions. What's my purpose? What's, what is life? You know, all of that. And I had this experience, and I write about it in the book, where all of a sudden the answer, like what really matters, was authentic beauty, not glamour. I mean, in our culture, it's all, glamour is an illusion. It's a trick. It's, it's ephemeral. Authentic beauty is eternal. And all, all authentic beauty truly is, is the creation of harmony. It's when all these different and disparate bits, I mean, think of music, all these different notes, sound, you know, each one is very different. It comes together and it creates cacophony or it creates harmony or mm. it creates beauty. So imagine, so what beauty is action is about is imagine if what a global understanding was that creating beauty and nurturing beauty is the most important thing. Not making money, not acquiring more, more, you know, now we talk about our materialistic philosophy, letting go of all that and instead focusing on what it means to create beauty. And this, in the book, and all that is blah, 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 blah. You know, it's all blah, 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 blah. Sounds great. So I said, how would you actually do this? Mm. I mean, to hell with, I, all right, so if I can convince enough people that focusing on beauty will harmonize everything, but how? So there are 16 practices of beauty. It's, so it's really easy. And it, you know, it doesn't cost any money. It, it's not about selling anything. It's really just about shifting the perception that most people have about importances. Mm. I love that. So some of the practices are practice seeing because too often we're on automatic pilot and we don't really see what's going on. Cultivate awe is another one. Um, honoring entropy is one of my favorites. Ooh. Um, practice taking sanctuary. Uh, anyway, so there are 16 practices. And um, another favorite is practice operating in the both and universe, as mm. opposed to most of us operate in either or. Right. This or this. Right. Well, how often, if we think about it as both and, and that also helps in terms of dealing with others. I mean, it's so interesting how we, we are all one. We are really all one. I agree. The trees, the... Yep water, this pen, yep. me, and we're just 
differentiated, individuated nodes on the whole. Yes. And how our culture has gotten into this polarization and us versus them mentality. Yes. And so if you can think, try and think of just even everyday things is, is it either or, or both and? Mm. So that's what beauty is action is about. <laughs> that's great. That's the heart of it all. I mean, I it completely is. agree with that and resonate with those ideas a hundred percent. Um, so yet another book that I have to purchase. Okay. I'm going to have to get both well, of your books. I see. I would love, I would love to hear from you what you think of beauty is of both of them, yes, because you I'd know, be many honored. people think unleash the girls is just for yeah. women and it isn't. I mean, yes. a lot of men have written me and gone, wow. Absolutely. But, but also beauty is action. I would love to hear your thoughts about that. I will definitely do that immediately after this call. I will uh, order from our best friend, Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Doing only good things. Um, no, I'm, it's, it's an incredible, it's an inspiring story. Everything that you've said is just mind blowing in many, many ways. I'm very glad that I, I met you. Um, I know we're approaching the end of our, our brief time here, but I do want to kind of wrap up with a few general questions. Um, one of them being, I like to say this kind of generic, but it applies. If you had one piece of advice for, again, a, a young girl or, or a boy or a man or anybody who has an idea or who might want to do something, what is your one piece of advice that you would offer? Trust your intuition. Trust your intuition. Full stop. Boy, that's good. That's a great sound yeah. bite. We can go with that for sure. Um, <laughs> and there are many things that, uh, we, that, that, that comes up in daily life. I know that I have this conversation with my wife all the time about what is intuition versus what is fear. We discuss this on a, a daily basis. about. Oh, well, then you, then you really do have to read Beauty is Action because okay. I talk about that. Oh, great. Sounds like it was meant to be. Uh, <laughs> I, the, the, the last... Uh, Question is, what, what would you say the best piece of advice you've ever received is? You don't have to make someone else wrong in order for you to be right. How has that shown up in your life? What are some examples? Well, I talk about it in Unleash the Girls. My business partner and I were very different people and we mm. had different values mm -hmm. and different style. And for a long time, I thought in order to be right, I had to somehow change her. And then I realized, no, <laughs> no, I don't have to make her wrong in order for me to be right and vice versa. Would you say that that's part of what they would call the abundance mentality in the parlance of our time? Or is it? Maybe. I never thought, I didn't think of it that way but um i yeah yes yes i mean i i think i write about that somewhere I, you know i have all these blogs on my website that and i can't remember what's in sometimes i can't remember what's in the book unleash the girls beauty is action are in the blog <laughs> <laughs> it all blurs together it all blurs together yes i the same way <laughs> Um, well, again, it has been truly, truly incredible getting to know you. Um, I can see for those who are listening, you have this beautiful home out in the woods in Vermont. It looks gorgeous on this fine summer day. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy life to sit here with me and to chat about your story. It's incredible. I do want to give you the last word um, to tell the audience where they can find you or support you or anything that you want them to look at or know. Well, I would say please uh, go to my website, which is www.lisalindahl.com. It's very simple. Um, and check out the book, Unleash the Girls. The untold story of the invention of the sports bra and how it changed the world. And I guess I'm big into changing the world because beauty is action is also beauty is action, the way of true beauty and how its practice can change our world. And um, you know, I tell everyone to be kind to yourself and others. 
Wonderful. Well, with that, we will wrap up the official podcast. So the podcast is now officially over. Well, that was truly an unbelievable episode for me. It was fantastic. I can't believe that I had the great fortune to have Lisa Lindahl on the podcast today. What an amazing story. Quite simply, they don't really get much more interesting than that now, do they? So again, at this point, if you've been enjoying these stories, if you liked her story, I can't tell you enough how difficult it is to put all this together to bring you something new and exciting every week. It's a lot of work and I'm just sitting here as one person trying to make a small difference in this world. You can help me by rating the show five stars, leaving a positive comment on Apple Podcasts, subscribing on Apple Podcasts, subscribing on Spotify, subscribing to me on YouTube. Follow me on Instagram at the Ross Palmer. Do anything you can to help this podcast grow. Share Lisa's story with your friends, with your family, with your coworkers. Show them that this podcast is a great source for inspiration and to help us all find newer, better ways to think about the entire context of our careers and lives. I can't tell you how much I, I, it means to me that you've made it this far. So thank you for listening to another great episode. I really appreciate it. So with that, this is the end, and I will see you next week on the Beat the Often Path podcast.